Well, thank you, Peter. And welcome, everybody, for the HSA meeting for September. <coughs> we know we've got people from Victoria and New South Wales, and I'm sure there'll be some others we're not certain about. And they're all welcome. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, local HSA news to impart this month, with not much happening with our constraints. Um, but I'll just talk about our future speakers coming up. <coughs> First of all, in the middle of October, 14th of October, uh, Michael, oh, you're going to have yeah. uh, Terry? Terry. Yes, yeah, Terry Popovic. We're going to talk about P47s and, <coughs> and uh, in the southwest Pacific area. I'm sure that'll be interesting. I reckon a lot of people don't realise that there are as many P47s and similar lesser known American types in the area, but there were quite a lot. Uh, the following month, at uh, the end of next month, I should say, at our usual date of the last Friday, we're having Daryl Purdom, we're talking about Sydney Cotton Part 2. We had an earlier talk about Sydney Cotton a year or so ago, before we were in this style, and uh, beginning on to the party reconnaissance information about him. And uh, for November, 27th of November, Michael Malt Kenton will be talking about Sir Ross Smith as an Anzac and an aviator, and it's been a remarkable story. And of course, we know most people know of him for his flight in 1919 from the UK to Australia, the first one. Uh, I'll hand back to Peter, and you can take it from there. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Warwick. Um, before I introduce uh, David, I'd just like to mention that we've got at least one special guest here tonight. There was due to be two. I don't know whether the other person's logged on yet. But we've got Juliet Reynolds has uh, logged on tonight. She's just smiled. Um, she, her mother, Jana Arthur, was uh, the WAF driver for General, sorry, for Brigadier General Kenneth Walker when he was based in Townsville during World War II. So uh, Juliet's joined us tonight. Now there was going to be, welcome Juliet, um, there was going to be a Lee Wilson um, who was the nephew of Dennis Craig, who was the flight engineer on San Antonio Rose. Now, I haven't noticed that um, Lee has logged on yet, so uh, whether he's there, I, I just can't tell. But um, So uh, I'd now like to hand over to David Lindley. Uh, David's going to give us a very interesting talk on the research-based reconstruction of the events that led to... Um, to the, um, the loss of San Antonio Rose and uh, his interpretation of where that particular B-17 uh, might have ended up um, after it was lost in action during World War II. So over to you, uh, David. Okay. Uh, we need to go screen sharing, Peter. Yeah. So stop other screen sharing, I'll go continue. Yeah. Oh, hang on. Sorry, I've got to stop. Share yeah, you. I've got yeah. mine now. There you ah, go. That's better. <laughs> right, um, okay, let's get going. Uh, I've got about 48 slides. So uh, thank you, Warwick and uh, Peter, for the introduction. And in the vein of uh, Peter's last comments, the third member of the uh, trio of uh, Juliet Reynolds and Lee Wilson is, of course, Douglas Walker, the son of uh, Brigadier General Kenneth Walker. And unfortunately, Doug has been uh, a bit sick and uh, has been in hospital actually, but uh, he's sort of, uh, judging by the volume of his emails in the last week, he's still, still a bit sick, but uh, time zone differences uh, got the better of him and he can't be here tonight. So he's gonna be watching it on Facebook. Now, uh, tonight it's all about searching for the San Antonio Rose. Uh, the first slide is, is a picture of uh, Rabaul Harbor. Um, it's a volcano, believe it or not. Now, most people think volcanoes are pointy things that go up in the air, but this is a in reverse volcano. This one goes down. So the entire harbor is an eight, eight kilometers east, left to right, and five kilometer in and out of the screen size caldera. Um, 
two of the three three features that stand out in many of the future slides I want you to note are the uh, beehives, which is that pinnacle of rock in the center. Over on the right, you've got the white, that white, uh, white ground on the side of a small hill in front of a bigger one. Well, that's Tavovo Crater. That's the one that erupted in 1994. And over on the extreme left, a smoke haze of, over Rabal Town. So that's, um, those three points are quite often in many of the slides I show. So uh, we just can't see the bottom and the, out to the right there. It's of course, there's a label Simpson Harbour. I don't know whether you can see that, but Warwick is sitting on top of it at the moment. So we'll move on. How do we advance the slides? This, how do we advance the slides, Peter? Are you the place bar or your arrows? It, got it, yeah. All right. Um, in good American style, I thought I'd start with a list of acronyms and names. Uh, I've had a bit to do with the Defence Prisoner of War MIA Accounting Agency, and they thrive on acronyms. So for us today, uh, some of the important things that I may just brush over and you'll all be confused are AOI, that's the area of interest in the coal mountains. We'll learn more about that as we go. DPAA is the Defence Prisoner of War MIA Accounting Agency. They're the US Department, Government Department charged with bringing home missing in action. Um, JPAC was their former name, and it's a bit like a leopard changing its spots. <laughs> JPAC fell out of uh, favour because they weren't doing a very good job and they morphed into DPAA. And uh, <laughs> hopefully, no one from DPAA is listening tonight. But for San Antonio Rose, their job hasn't been all that good either, but MACRA is missing aircrew report. That's a sort of a jargon from uh, at the end of the war that if lots of missing people had MACRAs uh, or aircrew had MACRAs. SAR, S-A-R is our shortcut for San Antonio Rose, a B-17F. 41, manufacture year 41, 1941, 2445A. It's quite remarkable. Well, it amazes me that the Memphis Bell, which is the most famous B-17, F had the number 24485. So, I don't know, just a quirky coincidence. UQ is University of Queensland. You'll find out more about that. And we called ourselves, uh, we thought we'd give ourselves an, an acronym as well. So we called ourselves WRG, Walker Research Group. Some of the geography, Simpson Harbour is the inner Rabal Harbour. Blanche Bay is an outer harbour, um, and we'll explain this on maps later. Carabia Bay is a tiny little bay near Vulcan Volcano. Tobovo Volcano is the active volcano we just showed you then on the first slide. Vulcan Volcano is the one opposite side of the harbour, uh, Tobovo. Lakanai airfield is the airfield that was used up to 1994. It's in Rabal town. It was used by the Japanese and it uh, sits near Tobovo crater. And Vuna Canal is an old Japanese, Japanese wartime airfield immediately south of the harbour. So part one, uh, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about the historical context for tonight's talk talk a little bit about Rabal and then a little bit about WRG. Now, um, this is the uh, only slide with a bit of meat and um, I, um, so I'll just kind of wade through it. It's important to know the sort of history behind um, the war effort in, around, centered on Rabal. Firstly, Rabaul was a massive Japanese air and naval base that was at the center of the Japanese Southeast area, with the military name for the area, the Japanese Southeast area. At the beginning of 1943, there was an estimated 300,000 tons of Japanese shipping in the harbor, 50 large and medium cargo vessels, 20 smaller uh, ships, 17 Navy vessels, including destroyers, were there in one sighting. 
So Rabaul was ripe for an air attack when you have so, so many ships, nearly 90 odd ships in, in the harbour. Now the Allies soon realised it was impossible to seize Rabaul or even starve out the 100,000 strong garrison in, in Rabaul. So Allied planning um, on what to do with Rabaul and the Southwest Pacific was underway by early July 1942. And they came up with a, there was a series of names given to the strategies, um, but finally it became known as Cartwheel. And D-Day for Cartwheel, the beginning of the Cartwheel operation was 30th of June, 1943. So keep in mind that Douglas Walker's plane, San Antonio Rose, disappeared on the 5th of January, 1943. So the planning was in hand but uh, and San Antonio Rose was lost uh, six months before the operation commenced. That's not to say the Allies weren't bombing the hell out of Rabaul in, in the months leading up to that day. The US-led operation was innovative, a hard-fought air campaign, and it meant capturing um, many small and building a ring of airfields ever closer to Rabaul. And then, then using those captured airfields, they launched a sustained, sustained bombing on uh, Rabaul to, to render it sort of a military irrelevance. So that was the reduction, to reduce Rabaul to military irrelevance. And it became known as, as the title of the slide says, the reduction of Rabaul. So the Rabaul campaign demonstrated a new form of warfare in which air power with the judicious use of naval and land forces could eliminate the need to occupy a ground objective area and, and they were able to control it without even occupying. And it provided a roadmap for the rest of World War II in the, in the Southwest Pacific. So uh, one point that uh, Doug was keen for me to make is that many historians know the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, which was the, which was the operation to destroy all of this shipping in point one. Literally, that, all of that shipping was taken out in a few days of uh, aerial activity. The airlift of Australian troops to defend WOW, and everyone knows of the battle for WOW, but there are few published accounts of the air campaign during the siege of Rabaul. So it's just a important piece of military history that's sort of poorly documented. So this is Simpson Harbor, 5th of January, 1943. It was a reconnaissance imagery taken before the arrival of the San Antonio Rose, uh, the Ro San Antonio Rose and the rest of the, uh, the uh, flight crews and whatever. So I, that's the beehives there, and this is Tobovo Volcano here, um, and that's Rabaul Town. Um, and I, yesterday I thought I'd try and count all the Japanese shipping there, and I, I, I got up to about 89 ships there on the 5th of January 1943. So a uh, bit of geography again. Simpson Harbour is the inner, inner part of well, firstly, the Rabaul Caldera is this uh, five kilometer long by eight, uh, sorry, eight kilometer long by five kilometer wide um, body of water, which in itself is a large volcano. It's a caldera last erupted 1,200 years ago. It's ringed by a series of small volcanoes uh, and the ones that keep erupting every 59 years of Vulcan and Tovovo, opposite sides of the harbor. And you, I'll talk about this later, but the Americans actually were bombing Tovovo to try and make it erupt to uh, displace the Japanese, so a <laughs> shortcut. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have Simpson Harbor, Caravia Bay near Vulcan. Blanche Bay is basically the outer part of the, the water body. Um, the two airfields are Lakanai, where the Japanese um, were obviously um, were obviously used by the Japanese. Buna Canal, um, Tobera, Ropopo, and they had another other airfields out to the west near Karavan. So these are all Japanese airfields around the uh, the town of Rabaul. 
And this slide on the uh, right is just to show that obviously the Allies were pretty successful <laughs> with their bombing of Japanese vessels. So that's just a, a guide to diving in Raval, and that's all the Japanese wreckage shipping sunk on the in the caldera in, in the ha in Simpson Harbor and Blanche Bay. So this is um, Rabal town uh, in the 1980s. It was, the Japanese arrived there on 23rd of January, 1942. They refused to surrender and um, they, they finally decided that was an, it was enough on the 6th of September, 1945. So they were just not able to be removed from the harbor. Beautiful place to live and I lived there for 20 years. So. That's the, uh, the geologists amongst the all, that's the Rabal Volcano Observatory up here on the ridge. It was there before the war. So um, back to the San Antonio Roads and uh, a bit of background about the, the crew and uh, Brigadier General Walker. One of the, he was one of the architects of the pre-war plan for strategic air war in Europe. He was the commanding general of the 5th Bomber Command. He went missing in action on the 5th of January 1943 on an unescorted daylight bombing ra raid to Rabaul. Um, the B-17 in which the general flew, this is probably the last image of uh, San Antonio Rose. The B-17 uh, has not been located, neither has Walker or any of the crew, never been found. And Walker remains the highest ranking, unrecovered officer lost in, in air combat in World War II. So the, uh, I think it was 11, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Yes, 11 people lost their lives on the San Antonio Rose. Um, two, two actually, uh, Benton Daniel, the co-pilot and Jack Bleasdale, actually parachuted out, bailed out just before the plane crashed. So uh, theoretically, nine people went down in, in, the, in the bomber and uh, two were bailed out, subsequently captured by the Japanese and never survived being POWs. So tonight, if we're lucky, we have Lee Wilson, um, a relative of uh, engineer um, Sergeant Dennis Craig who's hopefully with us tonight. And this is um, Brigadier General Kenneth Walker. He had a reputation from leading, leading from the, on, the front, on the front foot and leading many operations. So he, and he was an avid photographer. So um, yeah, he, he was taking photographs, they say, <laughs> on that morning when they decided to do a second orbit around Rabal Harbor which is very dangerous doing a second flight over. So uh, who was Kenneth Walker? Um, some of this slide I can't read because of imagery, images on the right, but Walker and other air power pioneers uh, sat down and formed a task force that wrote the air war plan, a a AWP-1, a plan for organizing, equipping and deploying um, um, aircraft to defeat Germany and Japan should the US become involved in the war. So they literally finished this plan nine day, in nine days in August 1941. And then a few months later, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and US, the US was in fact in war. So that's what Walker was part of this air war plan on how to defend Europe. So he was awarded the Medal of Honor, uh, not only for the mission in which he was lost, but for leading from the, from the front, flying many combat missions as commander of the 5th Bomber Command, uh, which was the primary striking force of the Allied Air Forces in the SWPA, Southwest Pacific Area. His loss is unique in that he was the highest officer, MIA, in combat in WW2, as I said, but he's also a re recipient of the Medal of Honor. So he's certainly a very high ranking person. And um, yeah, I mean, he's just been lost, but very little effort has been made to try and find any of the uh, nine people still missing with the San Antonio Rose. And that's, um, 
that sort of problem is one we've been exploiting through uh, Democrat Senator for Connecticut, and we've been putting pressure on DPAA to do something. So I thought we'd, um, and Doug thought we'd start tonight off with a connection between Walker and the RAAF. And uh, so General, Major General George Kenney commanded Walker to go reorganize the Allied Air Forces in the Northeastern area with assi assistance from Group Captain Garing, the Australian, from, an Australian from the RAAF. And um, so the RAAF uh, units were at Townsville, Cairns and Horn Island were attached to Walker. And um, anyway, so that was it. Walker was charged with that command. And uh, so, of course, in true Australian form, he had to be uh, welcomed. And so that's his invitation to the officers' mess, Northeastern Area Headquarters, to invite to Brigadier General Walker. And I've got two photos here, but one photo into the next tells the story. <laughs> There's a few bottles on the table here, and I can see Peter smiling already. But <laughs> um, that's Brigadier General Walker, and this is uh, Group Captain A. H. Cobby, Air Commodore. So he, uh, sorry, Group Captain Cobby. So he, with um, was closely with Walker. Uh, the fellow that Walker worked with was uh, Bully Bull Garing, William Garing. And that's him over here on the right. And you can see lots of people are looking at these bottles, so we better move on. <laughs> Number of bottles has increased on the table, and the, uh, at least uh, Brigadier General Walker seems to have maintained some composure. But anyway, in the true Australian style, they gave him a good welcoming to, to uh, Townsville, so to his new position. And that's Cobby here, he's always smoking a pipe. So that's, uh, and for Juliet Reynolds, I think Juliet supplied this photo taken by her mother, Jan Arthur, of uh, General Walker sitting at the table with uh, Cobby and, um, and some, some of the other hierarchy of the 5th Bomber Command, Townsville, 1942. Um, just a, a, a bleak photo of the area of operations. We have Port Moresby down in the lower right here, just off screen, the backbone of the spine of, of uh, the island of New Guinea and uh, New Britain here. Rabaul, held by the Japanese and the, col the subject of our tonight and where I think or we think the San Antonio Rose is, is here in the Coal Mountains. And you can see it, um, you don't have to be a genius to see that planes are flying, tracking to Rabaul and uh, back again, are, are going to pass over or near the Coal Mountain Range um, somewhere, either on exiting Rabaul or entering Rabaul. So this is Rabaul Harbour, and again, here's our landmarks, beehives here, and uh, Tobovo Volcano, which last erupted in uh, September, 26 years ago this month, September 1994. And um, yeah, I mean, it's Rabaul is the jewel of the Pacific. It's a fabulous place, and I was so lucky to have spent um, 20 years there. And all my three boys that are all listening tonight, they were all born here in Rabaul. And it can be beautiful one day and not so beautiful the, the next day. This is uh, the morning of the 19th of September, 1994, and that's uh, Tavovo Volcano and Vulcan, and Rabaul is just uh, turned into dark, nighttime. So twin volcanic eruptions, and they, the cycle periodicity of the eruptions is every 59 years, 1878, 1937, 1994. So they're very, um, very good in their timing. And this Japanese, uh, because of Rabaul is just uh, built on uh, very young volcanic deposits, the, the Japanese with a persistent bombing exploited the uh, great mechanical, engineering mechanical 
properties of the um, volcanic ash and there's something like, uh, I read the figure the other day, a thousand kilometers of tunneling under Rabaul or hospitals, workshops, accommodation. And here, this is on Tavui Point, that this is submarine base, as we call it. They actually, uh, well, you can see all the steel pieces and whatnot, um, RSJs and whatever, tunnels. They used to bring ashore materials to and from submarines here at submarine base. And of course, the bombing could, could not penetrate tens and tens or hundreds of meters of volcanic ash. So this is Tavovo, and uh, that's what it looks like when it's dormant, and then it starts erupting, and uh, dormant here too, 1983, and this is 94 here, eruption, and then uh, lava fountaining here in 1996. But uh, it last erupted in 1937 and it continued erupting into 42. So the Allied bombing was sometimes directed at trying to make Tavova start erupting again and, uh, and make it hard for the Japanese. But uh, I don't know. I've got no idea how many bombs were dropped on Tavova volcano, but that was part of the strategy to try and uh, make the volcano start erupting again and make it difficult for the Japanese. Walker Research Group, um, so one or two familiar faces here. Um, we all know the character on the left. Uh, so this, the currently active members, this was taken in New York, um, Peter knows the year. Um, Doug Walker and Gene Monaghan and myself are the active members. So this is Gene Monaghan here, a long time, uh, CIA uh, fellow, very analytical in his thinking and very good at accessing government records. And this is uh, Doug Walker, the son of uh, Brigadier General Kenneth Walker, whose lifelong mission for the last 30 or more years has been just trying to bring his father home. So he's getting, he's 87 in the uh, 19th of January this year, so he's, is uh, getting pretty old. And that fellow there, this is uh, Peter. <laughs> um, I haven't met these other guys. I know Justin Taylor there, but uh, Rick Dunn was with us. He wrote an article on our, on our work in 2014, but he sort of pulled back. Um, so it's just Gene, Doug, and myself. David, um, next. Back to the photo, David. I'll just tell them who the other two people are. Now, this yep. fellow uh, uh, next to me with his hand on my shoulder, that's Bill Barch, a well-known author. And the next guy beside him uh, is Noel Tunney, who's a Brisbane-based uh, author as well. So, sorry to interrupt. Bye. That's all right, because I'd forgotten their names too. So uh, me, I'm an Australian, and you probably can tell from my accent. Geologist, um, I've spent all my life working in PNG as, as a geologist, and I lived in Rabaul from 1981 to 1998, nearly 20 years. I was foundation member and secretary of the East New Britain um, Provincial Government's War Museum at Kokopo. And, uh, some of the highlights or whatever of my, I mean, being a geologist, you tend to walk around in the bush with your head down and uh, you notice things like this, this photo on the right. Uh, we found some wreckage and um, Brian Bennett, who's a, some of you will obviously know, the late Brian Bennett, was in Rabaul too at the same time. He used to always intercept me around town to see what I'd found recently. So we uh, actually found an F4U1 Corsair um, and Brian identified it belonging to, or people identified it belonging to a fellow named Jack Morris. And uh, he got out and blow me down. It was, I mean, it's miraculous that one day I got a phone call at eight o'clock in the morning saying, can you go to the museum? There's a man here wants to see you. And it's this, Jack Morris said, my ship is leaving at two o'clock. I've got to find the plane before the ship sails. 
and we said we've got we think we've got your plane in the backyard of our museum we we got wrapped on the knuckles by the national museum but we actually removed his wreckage um uh to the museum and put it on display and uh, jack morris was just so happy to see his wreckage um where people could see it and appreciate it so i took him then out to the bush this is where he thought his plane was uh well kokopo is here so his plane was a at Kokopo, sorry, here. This is where he thought he crashed. He actually crashed um, here. And he, he literally uh, carried his life raft down to the Sikut River and he sa sailed all the way down the Sikut River into the Wa Warangoy River and he got close to the coast, saw coconuts, knew the Japanese would be there, pulled his uh, dinghy ashore, slept during the day. And under the veil of night, he sort of swept out to sea and he hung around in all the flotsam and jetsam. He knew that uh, Catalinas would be following the bombing raids into Rabaul. One of them, for, for the reason they're always looking for downed um, pilots. They spotted him, they tipped their wings, knowing that the Japanese would be watching on shore. They came, came back the next day and picked him up and he was in Brisbane in a few hours. So yeah, that was a good good news story about finding someone's plane and them actually coming to Rabaul and had half a day to find it for themselves. That's the museum. Um, that's our logo. So it's an, it's just three, all of us are dead except for me. I'm the only surviving member of the museum, so it struggles on at the moment. Run on, on an extremely low budget. Part two, so this is the uh, meat. Um, what this is, is a reconstruction now of uh, the disappearance of the San Antonio Rose. It start, started at about 11 o'clock, it was a daylight raid, 5th of January, 1943. So we already mentioned there was a huge buildup of Japanese shipping and the allied intelligence expected that they were do the Japanese were working on something most likely they were going to go send shipping and supplies men to to lay to reinforce lay and um because they'd already just been be um the battle of wow had already been waged um um well had been what was being waged in early January 43 but but um, it wasn't going very good, so they needed to reinforce Lay. So this image is interesting because um, when you see the next image, uh, Jack Fellows, the wartime artist, used that as the backdrop for this uh, well-known uh, painting of the San Antonio Rose. And the caption, well, my caption is that Walker's Fortress continued to circle, well, observers noted, Walker's fortress continued to circle Rabaul once more whilst the main formation headed back to Moresby. And this is a fundamental mistake. It is likely the fortress took flak damage whilst conducting this extra turn. And, and as a result of that, the outer port engine caught a light. So that's uh, Jack Fellow's rendition of that incident. And there's Tobovo Volcano there. Rabal Town, Lakanai Airfield here. So um, we, the San Antonio, uh, the Walker Research Group of um, early on in about 2006-7, I, well 2005, Doug first contacted me and he gave me all the data and said, come up with a story and I did. So and it was quite easy to come up with the story, but no one else, uh, using all my familiarity with the Gazelle Peninsula, I'd walked every square inch of it, weather. I ha had a 38 foot yacht and I used to sail, so I knew all the weather, the winds, the clouds. Um, using a familiarity of the area, um, I put together a reasonably robust reconstruction. And so for the ensuing uh, years, it's been the search for the smoking gun, so uh, to try and find something would, which would um, torpedo the reconstruction or reinforce it. So it's 
it's gone from strength to strength. Uh, Jean Monaghan is a very diligent searcher, as I said, and uh, we had Rick Dunn at one stage, and uh, we had a Japanese fellow that lives in, uh, in the west coast of the US. He was very good. He accessed all the Japanese records and just trying to find anything. So one of the things he came up with was an Oscar pilot's map of San Antonio Rosa's track. So this fellow reckoned that he was the uh, pilot or was a pilot on the 5th of January when they attacked the formation and he was pursuing the limping B-17. Well, I mean, this, this was this sort of uh, curvy course that was easy to refute that because we know, we know that two of the crew bailed out here in the Mevlo Valley and were taken captive here at Toll. So, so I, some of the group wanted to follow this Japanese, Japanese reconstruction, but I was, I argued very strongly that it didn't fit the facts. So there are other, there was intelligence of prisoners of war and we knew that two people had survived the um, crash. We knew their entry ports, entry points to Rabaul from intelligence. Here it says that the route to Rabaul was first from Moresby to Cape, Ford Cape, which is Cape Orford, and then to Rabaul. So this is just two little snippets of information, but we had uh, lots and lots of this stuff that we've we've searched through. So from, for the rest of the presentation, I'm, it's literally uh, joining, like joining the dots, uh, a kid's, it was a kid's puzzle, just joining the dots. And uh, when I, I looked at all of the uh, observations and the information, they all aligned along a straight, a south, southwesterly, track and that because of my understanding of the terrain and the weather i knew i knew for example that and i argued with doug and the, the guys that if i was in an aircraft limping back to Moresby, i'm going to not going to be flying over high mountains i'm going to be taking the path of least resistance so this mevelo valley is a very large flat area and i and and this is obviously where the plane went because two crew bailed out here in the Mevelo Valley. So yeah, it was kind of um, all due respects to other people that might've worked on SAR, but it was sort of kinder, kindergarten stuff. It was seen to be so obvious. This is what's disappointing about DPAA and JPAC. What, what have they been doing all these years? So I, I've, just got my our sources of information there for those that really want to follow it through, but I don't want to talk any more about it. So we know that the San Antonio Rose was first reported overhead the airfield south of Rabaul, overhead Vuna Canal airfield. So that's that dot on the map. This is Vuna Canal in uh, airfield in 1943. And uh, Again, here's Tavova Volcano as a marker. This is a Rabaul uh, Blanche Bay here, and Rabaul Harbour is over on the left here. But the Vuna Canal airfield was reopened after the volcanic, volcano seismic crisis in 1983-84. It was reopened as an emergency airfield. It was a silly move because in 1994, when Vulcan erupted, and Vulcan's just here, there were huge boulders landing on this airfield. So <laughs> it was a mistake to even think about using this during a volcanic eruption. Okay, so the next uh, waypoint on the on the reconstructed route of the San Antonio Rose is here, about 20 miles south of Rabaul. We, we know from General Kenny's diary entries that that the plane was under heavy fire. There were two Japanese chasing it. One engine had an oil fire and it was seen 20 miles southwest of Rabaul, losing height, engine of fire, still under persistent fighter attack. So that's the second waypoint. Uh, this is the photo down on the right is a picture of the gap. That's 20 south of Rabaul. The plane was obviously flying through the gap in the range, the Binding Mountains into the Mevelo Valley. So, uh, I'm, and I'll tell you later on, the number of B-17 wrecks down in this area is, is uh, Halpiza's aircraft is down here in the Mevelo. I mean, all, 
it's so so logical that you you're exiting Rabaul, you're not going to fly out over the ocean like the Japanese pilot reckoned the plane was going whirly whirly around here. It's going to fly over the Mevlo Valley where if you had to put down, there's a good chance you might put down gently, as gentle as possible. So this is um, that gap, uh, the gap between uh, flying Rabal on the left side, the Mevelo Valley on the right, and this is, uh, I took an image, I, I took a photo of this area. Um, in fact, this is, I spent years exploring these, these very streams for gold, where, and found a gold mine just off the page here. But then Michael Claringpole put San Antonio Rose on this image in the Jap, Jap plane. So this is uh, San Antonio Rose, 20, 20 southwest of Rabaul. The next waypoint is a very, very uh, firm one, and that's we know now that two crew bailed out. And this is a very so they're the sources. Um, one of the sources um, is a father, a Catholic priest from Bougainville Island, Father Poncelet, was actually uh, imprisoned and. Uh, in his Bible, he kept a diary between the lines of his Bible, and, he, and in that he recorded that Benton Daniel was one of the prisoners of war. And we know from Japanese interrogation reports that the other person in that prisoner of war in the camps was uh, Jack Bleasdale. So this is, um, this is an overhead view looking, a Mevlo Valley is down here on the lower right. The Coal Mountain Range is in the top right with a bit of cloud cover. Wide Bay is here. The Japanese garrison, garrison was here at Toll. And um, so Benton Daniel was the uh, pilot, a pilot and Jack Bleasdale, Colonel, um, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Bleasdale was an observer. So it's my thesis that uh, when, when the pilot of the plane uh, decides to jump out, <laughs> then, then it's uh, dire straits. And it's probably likely that many of the other people on board the San Antonio Rose were shot, shot up, otherwise more people would have bailed. But, but for the pilot to get out of the plane, it was probably, um, it was near the end. And Jack Bleasdale also made it out, probably because he wasn't uh, injured. And uh, we know from the European Theatre of War and from my reading about that, that B-17s were remarkably flyable. They could be shot to pieces with all their flying surfaces literally gone, and they could limp all the way back from Germany to England and land. So um, I think it's not at all us that uh, Benton Daniel put this plane on autopilot. I'm not a pilot myself. I mean, I can almost fly a helicopter because I spent a lifetime in one, but I would assume uh, they would put it on autopilot and make their way to the exit and, and, and bail out. And the plane remained on autopilot and literally only, only had to fly that direction um, out to the south, south, southwest for another five minutes. And um, it would have impacted in the coal mountains. That's the thesis. So these are two, uh, two of our intelligence. First one is a Japanese uh, intelligence report, number 14, interrogation report of an American airman. And it says, this man was in, in the Rabaul raid. The airplane was attacked by our army fighters and the port engine was wrecked. So it's the San Antonio Rose. The airplane flew off to the south, losing altitude as it went in the neighborhood of the mountain of the mountain peaks north of Wide Bay, which is the area where I've just showed you. He sensed his danger and parachuted to earth. After this, he wandered in the mountains for 20 days, discovered a native dwelling, and hid, hid there to recuperate. On the statement of the natives that there was an English missionary at Wide Bay. He headed in that direction and on the way was taken prisoner by members of a naval lookout post at Sungan. Well, that's the Japanese name for Toll. So that's the uh, adventures of Jack Bleasdale and um, 
he wandered in the bush for 20 days and was finally taken captive. So that's Jack Bleasdale. The other report involves um, his actual uh, American Graves Registration Service report, um, Board Proceedings, number 2352, 27 of May, 1949. So it talks about, as indicated in basic communications, this aircraft crashed 10 miles, this is the report of the San Antonio Rose, crashed 10 miles south of the northern end of Wide Bay. Casualty reports state that Lieutenant Colonel Bleasdale was the only survivor of the crash. However, investigations by Lieutenant Downing reveal that Captain Daniel was also a prisoner of war in Rabaul. This information was received from Father Ponsulet, the MSC missionary from South Bougainville, who was a prisoner at Rabaul. And he kept a diary between the lines of his prayer book. It was sort of incredible stuff that this was happening. Captain Daniel was brought into the POW camp 12th of January, 43. So the plane went down on the uh, 5th of January. So um, Daniel only lasted seven days. Uh, Bleasdale was 20 days in the bush before the Japanese got them. Neither of them su survived World War II. So that's a uh, bailout here. And then the plane was on autopilot flying this south-southwest trajectory. And um, so there's an unverified report of a B-17 engine or wreckage in, in a prominent river here called the Ip River. Now this came from the national newspaper, Papua New Guinea Daily on the 7th of Jan, 2009. And I'm, have my spies on the ground. I have a helicopter pilot I've flown with for about 30 years and he's based in, in New Britain. So he told me there was a character called David Billings who reckons he's found a B-17 engine. Uh, so um, so I, uh, myself and my son have been looking at the satellite imagery just in, is incredibly detailed in the in this particular area, and you can actually make out uh, these straight logs of Pumareri, eucalyptus, very tall eucalyptus that grow in in the gravelly uh, rivers in Wide Bay and in PNG and the Philippines and that. But there's so my son in particular has been looking at some of the. I haven't been to the Ip River yet; it's planned, but. The strange looking thing, so this looks very mechanical, but it could easily be a block of limestone. Um, but I mean, this log would be a matter of 50 centimeters across. So the resolution of these images is quite remarkable. And here, uh, they always grow straight, is straight, um, straight stem or straight trunks. And so they're a whole pile of pomerary, but then you have a very unusual shape it's not a kumareri, they don't bend like that. So, and most other timbers that fall in PNG in the bush, so they rot, rot away very quickly. So there's, um, my son has been able to identify a whole lot of unusual objects. You can see that's object 16 and object 17. So um, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, unverified, but it's just, I sometimes think it might be the outer port wing of the San Antonio Rose that was burning and it fell off, but we don't know. It's part of the area of interest, AOI. So even the Japanese, I mean, the crazy thing about it is the American uh, DPAA, sorry to be so anti-American, but I guess, <laughs> I guess I'm an Australian, but... Um, well, it's frustrating because even the Japanese in uh, the Nippon Times on the 20th of January, 1944, said the San Antonio Rose crashed here. And that's that, this is the uh, sort of raid sphere of influence I put there. So this is a, a relevant passage. There's a whole two pages written about the San Antonio Rose and it said, after fighting the controls for a few tenth seconds, the major succeeded in flattening out the machine a short height above the ocean and flew the disabled fortress to about 70 miles southwest of Rabaul, New Britain, before he was forced to bail out with his cod pilot. I mean, that's the co um, Bleasdale and Daniel bailing out. Nothing is mentioned of seven other crew members. Well, it should be nine. 
and it is indicative that they were wounded or dead in the crippled machine and abandoned when the two pilots took to their parachutes. So uh, that's a remarkable that the Nippon Times in 1944 were reporting the, the downing of the San Antonio Rose. It was, it was done for um, propaganda reasons, but there it is. I mean, the Japanese knew about it. So this is um, our area of interest. It's about um, 10 kilometers, 110 square kilometers. This is the Coal Mountain Range. Um, Cape Orford is uh, down here, a very distinct point. So that's Cape Orford here in the background. Um, this mountain top here is, I mean, for Aussies, it's a remarkable height. It's 2,270 meters high. Uh, it goes from sea level here at Millam, Millam here, village, up to here. It's higher than Kosciuszko, just in a few kilometers. So it's incredibly rugged country. And that's, that's the reason why no one has ever been here. Um, so this is a, um, from imagery, this is, uh, Google imagery, this Google Earth, this is the Coal Mountains. Um, this is looking onshore from Wide Bay, the Ip River, where the reported engine wreckage is. And um, the really high mountain is here, 2,270 meters from, from the coast up. It's, um, yeah, so this is the target area for, for a search. It really needs mountain goats. Uh, to be the searchers, but <laughs> any volunteers? <laughs> so we know these are the facts. The San Antonio Rose was last seen going into cloud 10 miles south of the north end of Wide Bay. And, and this is uh, the north end of Wide Bay is uh, well over here to the right. When you scale off 10 miles south, you come to this area here. And it's right on that south southwest track. Missing the macro report, 10th of April 46, the San Antonio Rose was last seen going into cloud closely pursued by four to five zeros. Left outboard engine seen temporarily, temporarily smoking. Another report of the 27th of September 1947 said that. Um, uh, subject letter also states that General Walker had been killed in, in the plane while in the air and that the plane had crashed 10 miles south of the northern end of Wide Bay. And again, it's the same thing, as indicated, the basic, in the War Graves, American War Graves report of uh, 19, May 1949, this aircraft crashed 10 miles south of the northern end of Wide Bay. So I don't know how many times People have to write this in various reports that no one has ever acted on this. So the area of interest uh, crash site is the Seaward Coal Mountains, target area of 110 square kilometers has ident been identified. Now in my reconstruction, I think the plane was put on autopilot and obviously uh, Benton Daniel wouldn't put the plane on a dive so that it dove down into the ground, I think that the plane would maintain a, cons a reasonably constant altitude, probably steadily de decreasing. So I've, I don't know what, I'm not a parachutist, so I don't know what's the minimum height that parachute you can parachute from and land safely on the ground. That would be a vector that would tell us the height of the plane when they bailed out. But I, I put a minimum altitude of 800 meters, so everywhere between 800 meters above sea level and 2,270 meters ASL above sea level is a target on the Cold Mountain Range. Um, it's rugged. It, I know from my exploration on the Gazelle Peninsula, where I literally walk every stream to similar altitudes, rugged, difficult to negotiate above 1,400 meters, many waterfalls, Thin thickets, thickets of thin bamboo and, uh, and a tree, a fern called paspas. Pas means to block in pigeon, so paspas means really block you, can't stop you. 
on over steepened slopes. Some of the slopes must be nearly, what, 30, 30 degrees or more. Unexplored by timber loggers and mineral explorers, for that reason, unlikely to have been hunted by coastal Tomoyap and Sulka people. And I'm actually a good friend of uh, one of the Tomoyap um, community leaders, Matthew Mangil. He's my spy, spy on the ground in Millen to tell me what DPAA do, or when they're there, they give me reports. Um, but Matthew says the same thing, I, I, and I've seen it with the binding communities in Rabaul. They only, they're, they're not white people that climb tall mountains because they're there. They just go as far as they need to go to hunt a pig, and then they kill that pig and bring it home, bring it back to the village. Um, there's no reason to go into these cold areas that are steep. They go only as far as they need for their hunting, and then they return to the coast. So. There's undoubtedly this uh, this very major barrier to aviation exiting and entering Rabaul has remained untouched since the war. So I say high probability of aircraft discovery in the unexplored higher sections of the coal mountains. This image has nothing to do with our search, but it's just an I found a second my work or our myself found a second. Corsair wreckage, this time from the Royal New Zealand Air Force um, on the eastern part of the Gazelle Peninsula. It was just all buried. This is all we found, just a tire and a strut, I think it is. Or, and then the US recovery teams got in there on it. So it's very easy to hide a plane in, uh, in the bush in PNG. Now, the Coal Mountains AOI, I, I call it, my label for it is it's just a graveyard of World War II aircraft. So it lies obliquely to the, um, the route, exit entry route to Rabaul. Its lower elevations are ringed by um, Allied and Japanese aircraft losses. Um, and Brian Bennett, before he died, he gave me all, I took some maps to New Zealand with me and he said, no, he was visiting me here in Australia. He said, here, David, pull out your maps and I'll plot all the aircraft wrecks I know. So are, these are all of Brian Bennett's uh, aircraft wrecks. This is the, uh, sorry, I'm using my hands. This is the Coal Mountain Range. This is the area of interest in here. And the, the red are Japanese and the, uh, the other color, whatever it is, that's pink or purple, is uh, Allied losses. There's a B-17 there. That's how pieces B-17E, a B-17 here, just at the back of Toll. So you can see, and the C-47 here, RAAF C-47 crashed into the 2,270 meter peak, 15th of November, 1947, killing all 27 people on board. So it's a massive barrier right on the track of aircraft in and out of Rabaul. And uh, Michael Claringbold, who's now studying Japanese losses, he wrote to me this year and he said he would think there are at least 20 missing Japanese aircraft in this area. He reckoned that the Japanese were very good at flying over water with low visibility, but they weren't very good at flying over land with low visibility. So um, he, I, I bounced when I said, he said there's 20 planes there in that range. And I said, that can't be because from my experience on the Gazelle, and I've walked everywhere, I haven't found 20, 20 planes. And he said, but no, I'll stick to my guns. There's 20 Japanese losses here. And, and as I say, no one has ever been there. Okay, so just about to wrap up. Um, where to now? So Walker Research Group, WRG, maintains an active link with US, the US Senate through a defense fellow in Senator Richard Blumenthal, Blumenthal's his Democrat Connecticut office. And uh, Brian Coleman is the defense fellow now. He's probably listening tonight. He's an awfully helpful guy. And his predecessors have been too. Um, WRG is in collaboration. <laughs> yeah put exclamation marks about this one. WRG is in collaboration with DPAA in their Partnerships and Innovation Program. Uh, 
all of us, Gene, Doug and me, are very cynical of DPAA and their ethics. And it's only through Richard Blumenthal's office that is, and I've seen the documentation now from DPAA, they're finally handing us reports of their investigations. It's only political pressure that's forcing them to work on this program. So WRG, the latest is that WRG in partnership with UQ, we have put together an investigation proposal. It's with DPAA for a field program in September 2020 was the scheduled departure time. But undoubtedly, well, well I'm giving you this talk instead of being in the cold mountain range and um, obviously COVID-19 has sort of uh, delayed everything. But, but we've come a long way and they took me to Hawaii in uh, March this year and they gave me a training program on how to defuse the live bombs and identify planes and all sorts of stuff. And they called me an in investigative something. They gave me a fancy title, but it means nothing. Um, yeah, so it's very good working with the University of Queensland guys, Dr. Richard Martin and his team. And uh, we think we can do things when we get on the ground, but it's just a matter of getting onto the ground. Okay, so what has nearly, uh, estimating Gene, Doug and my time, what does 60 to 70 man years of effort result, what has it resulted in? Okay, firstly, this is where DPAA, in 2005, this is where DPAA, they interpreted 10 miles south of the north end of Wide Bay as being out in the middle of Wide Bay. And they said that San Antonio Rose had disappeared in Wide Bay. So it's our interpretation that says that the pilots and uh, Bleasdale bailed out here in the Mevlo Valley area, rounded up at Toll eventually here, and the plane just tracked straight through here. And if they'd read, if they'd cared to read the Nippon Times of 20th of January 1944, they would have known it was, the plane was here. But anyway, so that's one impact. It's taken 60 man years to have this vector switched and put over here and now DPAA they've sent three sorties to Wide Bay each have failed for various reasons uh, one of them got as far one party got as far as toll and for security reasons they were confined to toll they weren't allowed to leave the guest house there so that was a waste of time mobilizing people all the way from the states not allowed to leave the security of their guest house Another sortie, they snook up the Ip River to find this wreckage. One of them got a sprained angle, ankle, one got heat exhaustion, and they gave a camera to the locals and said, go photograph the wreckage. They said, the spirits up there guarding the wreckage, we have to go, all go back. So that was it, the Americans went back home. So it's been very, you can taste, uh, sense a taste of, disdain with DPAA. Um, yeah, so 60 man years to change that vector and 60 man years to get this Senate resolute, bipartisan re resolution up. In the, just on the eve of the uh, 75th anniversary of the disappearance of San Antonio Rose. And so it was Senator Blumenthal and Boozman um, Resolution, and this has really been a, a rocket, a rocket uh, fired at DPAA because I've read their official, some of their official reports this year, and it all talks about, oh, the US Senate is uh, desirous of bringing home San Antonio Rose. So, so the res resolution has been good. And that's it. Thank you. Um, in Rabal, we always have an expression, Rabal, you sweet more yet. Meaning to say, Rabal, you're really sweet. You're a really nice place. And uh, this is Tavovo again, but this is looking downwind toward Rabal. So you're looking toward Rabal there. And this is, that's it. That's some of the information uh, on General Walker and uh, some of the information I've used tonight. Thank you. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, David. Many thanks uh, for your very interesting presentation and your waypoint analysis of the fatal flight path of San Antonio Rose, or 
very, very interesting. Uh, I assume you're happy to take questions from people. David? Can no, that's good. <laughs> yeah, the question really that you've sold me on the idea of, uh, of that track, it's either gone into the mountains, as you're suggesting, or uh, it, uh, it had some sort of mechanical failure further along and might have dropped short, but it's certainly on that track. So do you know anything about parachuting? What, where, what's the minimum height you would bail out at? That's that's one I, thing I I'd never jump out of an aeroplane unless I was in their situation as well. <laughs> have you thought of trying um, cloud searching? That's the way they have found Steve Fawcett's plane. Now, admittedly, he was in a desert area, but they had a, hundreds of people who took a square kilometre and with satellite imagery, went in and closely examined it. And it would be more difficult with this, but there might still be something that could be seen from the satellite photos. You just need to get a bit of crowd searching. Well, um, my son has actually, and, and with myself looking over his shoulder, we've just examined the imagery there. Lands, it's Landsat imagery and the resolution is remarkable. You can see objects down to 50, centi 50 centimetres width. And uh, because of the over steepened slopes, there's a lot of landslides in the upper parts of stream headwaters. So you get a lot of stream, uh, the uh, stream burden, all the boulders and that in streams are easily visible. And, and, the, and the landslides act like conveyor belts. This is geological speak now. So these conveyor belts are literally have the potential to convey, uh, mm. convey wreckage. We, if the plane crashed at a low angle, then it wreckage. I saw um, the swamp ghost in Hawaii in March this year, and uh, very can very much a believer that a low angle approach, the wreckage would be strewn over several drainages. So we we've done that imagery sort of interpretation. We we've thought about using lidar. We've thought about using drones. We've thought about some electromagnetic surveys. But at the end of the day, quite frankly, I think the best way to do it is just boots on the ground and just walk some of these streams. And I have a team of people ready to go with the UQ effort. David, could I come in here? Yes. It's Julia. Yes, Julia. Uh, I just wanted to say, you've brought this so much to life. I've lived with this story for all my life. Um, my mother was um, Kenneth Walker's driver in Townsville during the war. Um, and they had a very close relationship, it would appear. Um, and it's something that I've lived with all my life, but you've brought this so much closer to home. And thank you. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you to um, Douglas for making this happen. I hope there's an outcome. Yes, I mean, it's... Uh... Doug is going to be listening to this later on, so I've got to be careful. It's sort of a race against time. Uh, Doug's not a young man anymore, and he's, a quarter of his life has gone into trying to do this. And this is uh, why we've all given up on the US government, D DPAA, because they're just um, unresponsive, non unsympathetic. I mean, um, there's a memorial stone for Brigadier General Walker in Arlington. And uh, I mean, it's the highest ranking MIA um, and uh, DPAO. So unless you can show them a wing and, and they can identify it in their lab as part of San Antonio Rose, they won't mobilize. They won't move on a, so a story like this. But they are. They're, I mean, we're forcing them to. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. There's a major problem all throughout the areas. The jungle can be so thick, especially after 70 odd years. Uh, you could be quite close to something and just cannot see it. Yep. Well, uh, one thing, uh, Warwick, that reminds me. One thing I didn't mention is that um, Doug Walker was, um, there it is, right down the bottom there. 
Doug Walker interview with Herbert Billington, 12th of May, 2014. We were trying to track down uh, anyone that was involved with some of these uh, bombing missions to Rabaul. Firstly, to confirm that the track out of Rabaul was through the Mevelo Valley, but also, well, we found that this man, old man Herb Billington, and he would never meet with Doug Walker. He was in a hospital. But boy, he had an iPad and boy, could he use it. It was always in upper case and he used to type pages and pages of information. And he was involved in the uh, searches immediately after the plane went missing. He was involved with the uh, recce to try and uh, locate San Antonio Rose. And he wrote it all down. And then he died a few, a few months later. So, And Herb Billington said there's no... Doug didn't want to put words in his mouth, but this old man said, there's no way the plane crashed over water. The plane crashed on land and we went up and down, up and down looking for it. Of course, being mindful that the Japanese were in uh, Zungun at, the, at their um, garrison there, they didn't want to sort of give, give it away that they're searching for someone important by going up and down, up and down on the same area. But yeah, the, the information from Herb Billington uh, was probably some of the most, um, for me, influential, important information in the search. Can I say something else? <laughs> Can I say something else, David? Yes. It's Juliet. Yes. On my mother's 90th birthday, I went into a website to try and find out some information about her Scottish heritage. I came across Peter Dunn's website. And at the bottom of the website, it said, does anyone know the whereabouts of one Janet Arthur, Townsville, 1942-43? And I thought, that, that is so bizarre, it's my mother. So I contacted Peter and um, it, sure enough, he put me in touch with Douglas Walker, who was the father of this wonderful Kenneth Walker that my mother had been the driver for in Townsville. Now, how yeah. freaky is that? <laughs> yeah. That was so yeah. bizarre. Yeah, Doug was, I, I can remember that time because Doug was really excited and thought we might get some leads out of your... Um, communication but sort of um yeah there was nothing well apart from sort of photos and uh and uh, filling in the story the australian side of the story it what didn't really there was nothing on png so to speak i mean oh. yeah we're always searching for a, the smoking gun and i guess you were one part of the smoking guns that we were hunting for oh, well i'm so, sorry yeah Smoking gun. <laughs> <laughs> Not hot onto the collar. <laughs> and I've now got a web page on Jan Arthur as well, um, with some of the photos that Juliet's given me. And Juliet's been up to Townsville, was it last year, Juliet? Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. last year. I, I happened to be in Townsville at the time, but I couldn't catch up, unfortunately. And she uh, managed to look at the house that uh, Brigadier General Walker lived in on the, on the hill there, just above the Strand, just behind Customs House. Yeah. I've got a photograph of some of the Townsville encampment because my aunt was a driver um, with the Air Force in Townsville during World War Two. Oh, right. Hmm. Uh -huh. so, um, General Walker must have been in Townsville only for a very brief time because he was soon in Port Moresby. I <laughs> would know the answer to this, I guess. Well, by the 5th of January, 43, he was in Port Moresby. Surely uh, his location should be on his military record. I think it's about four months or something. Something like four months. Yeah. At the end of 1942, in other words. Two, three, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we thought the 75th anniversary of the downing of the plane was uh, only two years ago, and you would have thought we had a Senate resolution and that, but it's just um, 
it's probably easier to climb Mount Kosciuszko than to <laughs> mobilize, get DPAA uh, to back us in going to find this wreck. Yeah. I mean, and, and talking to Michael Claringbold only about two, three months ago, I mean, he, he just, uh, from his experience, he's a pretty knowledgeable guy. Uh, he just said, look, there's, there's going to be an infinite number, literally an infinite number of aircraft wreckages here in, in this range. It's just untouched in a major aircraft corridor. Any other questions? I, I, it's Nigel Dorr from Adelaide. I'd just like to congratulate you, David, on all the work you've done. Mm. And I wish you all the best um, in uh, that, that, that you achieve that, the result in your lifetime. I'm a former one talk. I had a couple of years in Papua New Guinea with the number one bank, Commonwealth Bank, oh, yeah. in the early 70s. And then I didn't go back until two years ago on a cruise. And it did take me to Rabaul. Yeah. And of course, it had changed. Um, it's just quite new, isn't it? So this, this, is, this Zoom setup has been really good because, of course, there aren't enough of us members in Adelaide. And I was part of this the recent Melbourne Zoom message, although here I'm mixed up with the Aviation Museum. But this has been, this has been a really good uh, setup uh, with Zoom because I, j I just hope it continues because then um, as an interstate member, I, I can participate. And I'd like to congratulate you in particular, but everybody involved with it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nigel. Yeah, thank you. And I'd like to say it's one of the best presentations that I've seen lately. It's legible. It's got a few pictures. It's got wonderful maps. And it, it really helps to be able to see them on screen. And I think you did a great job putting it together. Thanks, Alan. That's really good. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, it's... Uh, I mean, it's uh, been a three, sometimes four, sometimes five person um, effort. And it's, uh, I'm not kidding when it's 60 or more man years, because Gene and Doug have worked this at least 10 years before they caught up with me. And I've been working on it since 2005. So what's that, 15, 16 years. So it's, and Doug usually sends about three emails a day multiplied by... <laughs> Seven days a week multiplied by 366 days. I calculated the number of emails. There's some, I don't know, 10 or 20,000 emails have <laughs> gone backwards and forwards about this. Just so Doug has been, uh, he's prolific at using face of oh, emailing and Facebook and things like that. But I mean, it's uh, sad. It's a quest of one man to mm. father home. And I mean, there's eight other people there as well. But it's just um, the reluctance of the U.S. government to do anything. Did the Japanese ever go looking for their downed aircraft? Um, Michael Claringbold would be the best uh, to answer that. But I think, um, oh, whose talk were we listening to recently where some of the wreckages that were found were had, uh, Japanese were advised about it. Was it looking for the plane in uh, West Papua? The fellow from Holland that said he'd found... Oh, yes. That, that oh, yes. Japanese. But, I mean, I in Rabaul, uh, no. I mean, I've been in Rabaul a long time and involved with the Provincial Governments Museum, and uh, we've never had Japanese as such. I mean, the Australians are always there detonating bombs and things like that were in our museum <laughs> but uh, and elsewhere. The Australians are active with the US recovery teams, but I've never heard of Japanese being there in Rabaul anyway, mm. and, and Rabaul being a major Japanese fortification. Mm. 